Welcome to The Property Perspective, a podcast by Knight Frank Australia. We'll share expert analysis from industry leaders, focus on key trends and forecasts, and bring you the latest topics shaping Australia's property market. Thank you for joining us on the latest episode of The Property Perspective by Knight Frank Australia. I'm Emily Ralph, Head of Living Sectors for Asia Pacific uh, for Knight Frank, and I'm joined by Ben Burston, Chief Economist in Australia, and Tim Holtzbaum, Head of Alternatives. Uh, and today we'll be discussing Beyond BTR. We last caught up in July 2023 about the build to rent sector and, and the pos- possible growth. Um, so I think it'd be really interesting to come back and see if our predictions have come, come through in the, la- in the last six months. But also, I'm keen to talk about the expansion of new living sectors um, in Australia and where we see potential over the next six months. Uh, Tim, Ben, perhaps we can just start with a bit of an overview in terms of the the macro environment. Obviously, we're still in a a high interest rate environment, which is um, an ongoing challenge for property markets. Ben, how do we think the living sectors is reacting to this? How is it holding up compared to other sectors? Uh, hi, Emily. Um, I think the, the shorter answer is a bit better. Um, I think the, the longer answer is more nuanced in that you know, all, all sectors have been um, impacted by higher interest rates. It's uh, a, a key uh, key driver of what's going on in property markets and that steep increase that we that we saw has been disruptive, but you know, it's been with us for some time now. And so I think um, investors and developers have had some time to, to adapt and, and, and think about what they're doing. And I think one of those adaptations, as we discussed last time, has been uh, a greater focus on living sectors because there's belief there um, that it's it's the, 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 the different categories of asset with, within it will uh, benefit from um, strong rent and hence income growth um, in the near term. That they'll be, that'll be less cyclical, there'll be less impact than other sectors. And I think that's borne out Coming back to your question in terms of how has the market fared, um, obviously we've been through a period where there has been relatively thin trading volumes across um, across the commercial market. So I think last year, um, figures from Real Capital Analytics show that you know, the overall volume of trading in the Australian commercial market, if we look across office, retail, industrial, um, and other sectors, including living sectors, that that was down by around... Um, 50% and even more significantly down if we look at offices in particular, which I think was down um, around 65%, but the amount of investment activity in living sectors actually grew, um, coming off a lower base, uh, obviously, um, and I'm sure we'll come back to uh, the point, of course, it's more of a development market rather than a market for traded assets, but we see a lot of appetite there, and I think that um, you know, that's for a number of reasons, uh, as I've mentioned, and people are prepared to look through probably some of the near-term um, issues caused by you know, obviously high funding costs and high construction costs, which I saw we'll, we'll, we'll come back to, but um, they have a, st- a strong long-term positive you know, outlook on, um, on the sector. So it is uh, coming through this uh, difficult period uh, more easily than other parts of the commercial market. So... Transaction volumes uh, and activity seems to have held up better in, in living than other sectors. What about pricing? So I think in the commercial sector, particularly office, we've seen some, some move out of, of yields. Um, what about in living, um, Ben, and, and then may- maybe Tim can touch on what he's seeing on the ground. I, ha- have we seen some softening in pricing there, or is it difficult to tell with, with perhaps some lack of transactional evidence? I think it's difficult to tell in terms of lack of uh, transactional evidence. I'll be interested in what Tim has to say in terms of um, people are building into expectations. So it's probably less about the um, what sort of pricing is being achieved on tr- trade trades of established assets than they're more about what people are you know, confident underwriting. And I think with the um, the rise in rates, yeah, obviously we've seen all, all sec- all yields across all sectors pushing out, but that's been to a lesser degree. Um, in, in living sectors, so I'll, I'll probably hand over to Tim for more on the you know, on the detail in terms of, of what we've seen. Yeah, I think um, what we're seeing in terms of call it prime, say BTR stock uh, across global markets, whether it's the US, the UK, uh, and now more recently Australia, is that 
whilst we've seen a bigger expansion in cap rates in places like the US uh, and also the UK, so 100 basis points for the US and somewhere between 50 and 75 basis points for, say, Prime London, when we look at it here in Australia, we would expect to follow a similar trend. However, what seems to be tra- taking place here is that we are seeing less of an expansion in our cap rates just due to the weight of capital trying to get into this market, but also the demand supply dynamics within our market. Um, such low vacancy rates and such strong appetite coming from investors looking to get in the market that if there are assets that have traded or are uh, have the potential to be traded, everyone is forecasting uh, a slightly lower um, blowout in some of those cap rates. We think that it's it's challenging to tell because we are not seeing that transactional evidence, but, but sentiment is still strong because of that weight of capital. Um, and that capital, Tim, where is, where is that capital coming from? Is it very domestic or overseas capital? And where is it really focusing on the living sectors? I think you've got some pretty established local investment managers and developers that are active in the, say, the build-to-rent space uh, at present, and I think they are keen to keep deploying capital and keep building out their portfolios. They've set up large teams, and they're and they're looking to build out the the platforms as they have written in their in their business plans. But I think certain capital that they had been dealing with is now te- perhaps slightly more tentative on the sector or they've got some exposure to certain markets and they don't want to continue that exposure. So these local developers, investment managers are out there looking for new sources of capital. I think we could probably say that the, it's the Japanese capital has been probably the most interested in the Australian living sectors over the past 12 months. Um, but it also, interestingly enough, this style of capital seems to be less programmatic in nature and or going down the route of a single site acquisition basis and therefore happy to spread their allocation across a number of different investment managers uh, in the aim of acquiring the, the best sites uh, and the best assets um, from where they sit. And I think as we start to see, and we'll come on to this, the expansion of the living sectors in some new asset classes like co-living, for example, we are seeing <coughs> new sources of capital come through from some of the Asian markets as well um, and some of the you know, Singaporean, and Hong Kong um, listed and unlisted um, entities. And then also late last year, we're starting to have some conversations with some US-based capital as well that wanted to, to start to get some exposure into the Australian market, which have, for all intents and purposes has been pretty quiet for the last 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I think we'll absolutely start to see that US capital coming back, um, particularly into some of these living subsectors, which they're very experienced in in their own market. Um, but before we come on to that, um, Ben, I just wanted to ask around, you mentioned earlier kind of construction costs and some of the challenges we referred to in July um, that investors and, and developers are facing in, in delivering living sectors. Are these challenges kind of still in place? Are we expecting them still to be in place? And, and kind of what's the outlook for, for 2024 in terms of delivery and and how it, this can address the housing undersupply in Australia? I think the challenges are, are, are still there. I think they've been well documented within the um, within the industry for the past 18 months. They're still there, but they're, they're, I'd say the outlook has become a bit more positive. So I don't, I don't think those factors have fundamentally changed yet, but compared to when we had our last discussion in July, I think we can say with a bit more certainty that things are getting better. And so you know, of those factors, um, you know, I, I think last time we spoke, the, the cash rate in Australia would have been uh, around was either 3.85 or 4.1. We had we had at least one further I- rate increase. We had one I- in, in November, but now in terms of that pressure on funding costs, I'd say since then, um, in, the, in that relatively short space of time, um, since that last rate rise in November, I think we've seen a fundamental shift, not only in Australia but globally. I think we've seen more and more evidence that, that inflation is coming down and that the cost of goods, rather than the cost of services, is the main driver of that inflation coming off. And, and within that, um, we've seen some of the pressure coming off construction costs. Now, so they're still high, um, so, so that hasn't changed, but certainly the rate of increase has 
um, ha- has come right down. And so it, it's possible. We, we hope, we're not sure, but we, we might see some actual falls in, in, in costs later in the year, which would make things easier. So, so I d- that hasn't changed, but I think the outlook there has become more positive in terms of inflation, in terms of interest rates. Well, I think following that, that increase, you're given that big drop-off in inflation, and we had numbers in Australia coming out last week which showed that our on an annual rate we've come down to 4.1%, but the number for Q4 was only 0.6%, and so I think... Um, we'll have an announcement from the RBA um, soon today, so that d- d- dates our, our, our recording. But by the time people will um, have heard this, we'd be expecting that interest rates will be on hold. And, and, and the general sense is that um, we, we've peaked uh, and that now, as we look ahead, and certainly compared to this time last year when there was un- uncertainty and, and a general feeling that we had more rate rises to come, I think that's now... Um, you know, we're now in a different situation, so we're not sure, you know, when and to what extent we'll see some easing of interest rates. But certainly, from an outlook, from an investor developer perspective, that's become um, that's become more positive. I think on the supply side, well, I, I think um, those factors are obviously a restraint on supply, and so I, that that continues to be the case. It's partly why um, I think. Inve- I mean, Tim mentioned a more programmatic, you know, uh, sorry, a less programmatic approach that probably speaks to um, a broader tapering off of the speed so there may have been an initial intent to move quite quickly and, and develop quite quickly but I think with these pressures in place that's probably slowed uh, the intent down somewhat but I think the long term intent um, is very much still there and c- on the wider point of supply I mean we, we have um, we are a real shortage of rental accommodation I mean built to rent is viewed um, at all layers of government, I think, as part of the path, part of the solution, I mean, not the solution, but part of the solution to sort of help us restore to more normal levels. But it's going to take some time. And um, notwithstanding the, 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 the fact that we're getting strong rent growth at the moment, um, it's still a challenge to make schemes viable. Um, the government's put in place you know, a very high target, um, an aspiration to build one2 uh, new homes in Australia over the next five years. I think that's been, um, yeah, it's widely recognised that that is probably, it's to say it's a challenge, it's an understatement. I mean, it would probably it would require a huge ramping up, you know, I think even at peak levels of uh, construction back in, I believe it was 2016, um, we got to about 220,000 homes per year uh, as the peak uh, level. And so to reach 1.2, well, that requires... Uh, 240,000 on average over the next five years. We're nowhere near that at the moment. Uh, and I think all these pressures on uh, construction you know, that we're talking about, even if they gradually ease from here, um, we're going to be in a market with constrained supply for some time. I think, though, the interesting thing to note, Ben, is that <coughs> we, if we look back three, four years ago uh, as the BTR sector was starting to emerge and we started to have those kind of early groups really looking to drive the sector forward, there was a real lack of available sites and potential opportunities for them to actually acquire, and uh, uh, albeit with an abundance of capital, so to speak, in these programmatic forms where they could have actually deployed uh, a lot of money to the sector very quickly. Um, but I think if we fast forward to today, if we have those same discussions with the developer investment managers here in Australia, they would tell you that there is an abundance of opportunities from a site-based perspective, but it's probably the capital constraints now that are holding things back. Now, one thing that is always prevalent in development is planning risk, construction risk, um, and and certain underwrite assumptions that you're going to have to adopt as any sector rolls out uh, in terms of rental levels, leasing up timeframes, and and exit cap rates that you're going to apply to a feasibility study. But I think... From a positive standpoint, from a supply perspective, I think there are a lot more sites in our major cities now, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, um, which will hopefully go a long way to um, solving for some of that supply issue. So in terms of supply issue and, and addressing this you know, rental undersupply um, and housing undersupply generally, how much is the market looking to other subsectors of of living to address this and I, I suppose the, the the sector I'm really interested about is co-living given that it as addresses that cohort of of um, tenants from <coughs> maybe 20 to 35 that that really are lacking that housing availability um, but it's a very nascent sector um, 
Tim, where do you see opportunities in co-living? Is it something that over the next five years we're going to see really expand? Yeah, I, the intention behind co-living, I think if you go back two, three years ago, was a topic that probably wasn't widely discussed amongst the developers uh, here locally. But I think fast forward to today where we've got, <coughs> you know, limited supply constraints, but we've also got an abundance of capital that needs a higher return level. Um, something like co-living can then start to look like an attractive option for that higher returning base capital, uh, given the um, zoning around the co-living and the classification around the co-living asset being commercial residential, um, means that the investment periods for those particular assets, you can get in, develop and stabilise the asset and trade out faster than you could a BTR asset, so therefore you know, it allows those investors to get a higher return on a shorter time period. And I think then that starts to speak to the capital that's active in the market at the moment. So we have had obviously well-documented, very strong rental growth over the past 12 to 24 months. I think to couple that with an abundance of high returning base capital that wants to be deployed into our market, um, it sort of speaks to this new asset class coming to our market in co-living. So you, you talk about high returns in co-living. Can we give listeners a bit of a feel of, of where returns are for for co-living, say, in Sydney and how that compares to BTR and maybe how that compares to student? Kind of where on the spectrum uh, does co-living lie? So from a cap rate perspective, the way that we're looking at these assets from a valuation standpoint, um, we would look at a prime BTR-style asset in the Sydney CBD at, at as an example sort of in the early fours, I think uh, the co-living asset, when we typically look at BTR co-living as student on a global basis in other more established markets, the co-living asset seems to sit somewhere in between the student asset or the PBA, uh, purpose-built student accommodation asset and the built-to-rent asset. So that would be kind of you know, 475, 485 uh, percent and then the student asset would be anywhere between sort of five and, and up from there. But it obviously depends on the asset size, quality, location, those sorts of things. But it kind of gives the listeners a view as to how the values would tend to play out and, and what groups are using from an underwrite uh, perspective in their feasibility studies when looking at these assets. But from an internal rate of return perspective, um, BTR being a kind of low teens style return, the co-living assets seem to spit out more of a kind of mid teen style return and that's really um, where investors or where the majority of capital is at the moment. With less core money in the market and more opportunistic money, you can see why this asset class is starting to have interest in and Australia. I, and I think what we can see why from a from a market perspective in terms of the, the, the demand supply dynamic. So, you know, we have got a broad we've got an undersupply which is which is recognised, but we can't address that through any one particular model. Uh, you know, we need more affordable housing. We need more private rented accommodation. Um, traditionally in Australia, that's come through uh, build-to-sell apartments, but obviously there's a place for build-to-rent. And within that uh, envelope, we need different types of stock. And I think with the pressure on rents at the moment and um, the the swift return of international students, which is probably something we touch on in the, in the context of student housing, uh, it's tightened up that market and so there is a need um, for a more affordable option within the private rental market uh, and so co-living, we don't know, we, we haven't had it before in Australia but we've seen that model successfully rolled out um, overseas and I'm sure that there's a place for it in Australia. I think there's a absolutely a place. I think that there's probably, co-living is a bit of a grey area in terms of what actually is it. Um, it kind of sits quite close to hospitality, service apartments, in terms of the tenure being shorter, the churn being much more, um, amenity levels being quite a bit higher. Um, can we just, and Tim, maybe this is one for you to touch on, exactly what is co-living product in Australia? Um, who does it appeal to? Who's living there? Um, and what's really important for a developer and operator to think about um, when looking at their co-living assets? Yeah, as you mentioned, we, we do have versions of co-living in Australia. 
um, be it the service department style living or what was termed as the new age boarding house um, assets that had been developed over the past five to ten years. Um, but co-living is really um, probably an evolution of, of a purpose-built student accommodation asset really whereby you have um, a large number of uh call it furnished studio style apartments um, providing kitchenette, bathroom, um, bedrooms, you know, real self-contained living environment, say anywhere between 25 and 35 square metre um, sizes with then a communal ground um, amenity offering to the occupants of those apartments providing access to commercial grade kitchens, TV areas, co-working style areas, um, outdoor spaces with barbecue areas. So a higher emphasis on the kind of social aspect of what it would be to live in a um, building of anywhere between 50 through to 250 furnished studio style apartments. So from a demographic standpoint, they're really targeting early to late 20 year old demographics now we do see some tenants who are slightly older than that and, and some that are slightly younger however I guess the broader appeal of the co-living asset is that <coughs> A is a furnished option but B you can also get shorter tenures within these particular assets so our typical lease tenure here in Australia for a build to sell style um, apartment or even build to rent for example would be a 6 or a 12 month lease so in co-living, we'd see a three-month lease offering with the ability to then roll that on, an, on a three-monthly basis or take a six-, nine-, or a 12-month lease. So it provides flexibility for tenants. It provides a furnished option for tenants, which is pretty uncommon in the Australian market, uh, unlike places like London, for example, where the majority of apartments are furnished. Uh, and we're seeing a, a really strong take-up of that Flexibil uh, flexibility uh, offering and also the furnished offering in our market. Thank you very much for, for tuning in to the latest episode of The Property Perspective. Hopefully you found this uh, conversation insightful. If you'd like more information, please do reach out to, to Ben Burson, Tim Holtzbaum or me, Emily Ralph. Thank you again. That's the end of part one. Please stay tuned for part two. Before you go, subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on the next episode of The Property Perspective, when we'll be back to share our take on more key trends and topics shaping Australia's property market. You can also follow us on LinkedIn or visit our website at nightfrank.com.au for more information. Thanks for tuning in. It may be the end of the show, but we're always your partners in property.